everyone is talking about the possibility of an AI winter. The bubble bursts, the hype crashes, the funding dries up, and their AI boom freezes over. Breaking tonight, venture capital pulls back as AI investment dries up worldwide. We call it a cognitive crash. The truth is, there's simply no more new data left to train on. But what if this winter is exactly what we need? We've seen this cycle before. Three times, in fact. Huge promises, massive investment, and then reality hits. But this time, it's different. Millions of us are actually using AI every day, not just governments or corporations. So here's the big question. If an AI winter is coming, what would it teach us? And could it actually make AI stronger? We're gonna be digging into what we can learn from the frosty periods before, the warning signs we're seeing today. Plus, I asked four different AI models from four different AI labs to plot out what happens when this cognitive crash lands. Let's look at the AI winter. This idea of an AI winter that's been floating around tech circles and Jeremy Kahn has written up a brilliant reflection in the Fortune publication. I'll put it in the notes. If you're not familiar with the term, an AI winter is basically when everyone gets really excited about artificial intelligence, dumps a ton of money into it, and then reality hits. Investment dries up and companies pivot away. And AI goes back to being something that only researchers and university labs actually care about. Here's what's wild, though. We've actually been through this dance before, three times in fact, and each time people act like it's the end of the world. But looking back at those winters might have been exactly what the field needed. Nick, just three years ago, most people had never actually heard of ChatGPT. AI was this invisible thing running the background of your Netflix recommendation or helping your phone kind of recognize your face. It was not front of mind. It was not front page news. There was not many podcasts on it. And it wasn't driving trillion dollar stock valuations. Your grandmother was not asking about whether robots were going to take her job. I mean, it's incessant. I mean, I don't even answer her calls, my grandma's calls anymore. Like, I mean, just, just give it a rest. <laughs> this, this is classic Gartner hype cycle, right? So, I mean, we're sort of coming into this thing and energy gathers behind until you, you run up into the peak of uh, inflated expectations. Is that what it's called? Um, and, and this is where we are. This is a, this is a really interesting time and it's, it's broken into the public consciousness, general public awareness. Um, and yeah, Nan, please stop calling me. I love you, but let's talk about other things. Just chill out. <laughs> but now we've got CEOs promising artificial general intelligence, machines that think like humans. They think they're just around the corner. And we've got Zuck giving out the biggest paychecks we've ever seen to build super intelligence. We've got hundreds of billions of dollars being poured into data centers the size of small cities. And at the same time, as you've just touched on recently, 95% of corporate AI projects are failing to deliver any real value. Yes, I know it's a dodgy research piece, but it is important data. Does this sound familiar? Because this exact pattern has played out before. Let's go back to the 1960s. Researchers promised the Pentagon that machines would soon match human intelligence. The government wrote massive checks, and when the technology could deliver, funding disappeared. It dried up overnight. Winter number one. The 1980s brought us expert systems, basically computers programmed with all the knowledge of human experts in specific fields. Companies went crazy for them. These were computers that filled entire rooms until they realized that these systems were incredibly fragile and expensive. One unusual situation, and they completely break down. Winter number two. Then, in the late 80s and 90s, there was neural networks. This is the start and the foundations of today's AI. And they had their moment until researchers concluded that they required too much data and computing power to be practical. Winter number three. Each time, the same pattern. Massive hype, massive investment, reality check, then silence. But a provocation. A call for a collective black hat. A, a joint balaclava, as it were. Company metaphor. Come on, team. <laughs> get, 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 get in this crime sombrero. wear with me. <laughs> the black sombrero. It's cozy. Maybe those winters weren't bugs. Maybe they were features. Maybe the field needed those reality checks to figure out what actually worked versus what was just impressive tech demo. And maybe we need another one right now. Because right now, there's a lot of frantic energy around AI deployment. Companies are scrambling to add AI to everything, regardless of whether it actually makes sense. We're seeing AI chatbots that confidently give wrong answers, AI systems that work great in controlled environments, let's be honest, but fall apart, often in the real world. Employers crying out at being overwhelmed and stressed because learning AI feels like a second job, and business leaders making massive bets on technology that perhaps they don't understand. And so what if an AI winter 
could give us something really valuable. Time to actually learn how to use these tools effectively. Time to figure out where AI generally helps us versus where it's just expensive theatre. Time to address some of the fundamental reliability issues before we bet entire industries on this technology. Time to question whether... Elon Musk, the richest man on the planet Earth, should use his XAI platform to release any more sexy avatars. I think we can fill in blanks there around the answer to that one. The difference this time is that unlike previous AI booms, they were driven by government funding or corporate research budgets. Hundreds of millions of regular people are actually using these tools. I had a chat with a friend's mum yesterday about how much they, how much she loves using it. They've experienced what it's like to have AI help them write an email or debug some code, solve personal problems, and a lot, lot more. That knowledge doesn't just disappear when this hype dies down. It's it's interesting, eh? Like, um, have you heard of Amara? I'm going to butcher that. Amara's law, Amara's law. I mean, apparently, mm-hmm. so, yeah. Okay, and, and this was new for me this week. So Roy Amara, just for context, he was a, a futurist um, or a computer scientist at Stanford who said that we tend to overestimate a technology's short-term impact while underestimating the long-term impact. And I would suggest that's exactly, I'm just echoing you here, that's exactly what's happening with, with AI. So we're overestimating the hype now, thinking that every company needs an AI revolution by Q3, Q4, but we're, we're massively underestimating what's quietly happening in homes and classrooms and around the world. I mean, case in point, my sister is out in Eastern Europe now, and uh, apparently ChatGPT, Gemini, uh, is planning half a holiday for her. Educators, as, as mentioned before, are creating these wonderful interactive enhancements to their lessons in an hour or less, things driving real impactful change in the classroom and beyond. Small business owners are automating their books, right? Or, or logistical flows, operational, everything. These aren't billion dollar use cases necessarily. They're a, a 10 or a month kind of solution to real problems, but that really adds up. And, and you can't invent that. So when previous AI winters hit, the tech, as you said, retreated to corporate labs and sort of fizzled away, died, dried up. But you can't make millions of people, your, 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 um, so your friend's mum, right? Forget that they have a writing assistant in their pocket or teachers that they've discovered that they can create inclusive learning experiences in minutes rather than hours. And maybe that's the difference this time that AI has escaped the lab, made itself truly useful to, to regular humans. There's another angle to this that really drives the point home. The UN just released their first global risk report, where they surveyed over 1,100 stakeholders from 136 countries. Government officials, business leaders, academics, asked them to identify the risks that they were least prepared for. Guess what made the list? Negative outcomes of artificial intelligence and frontier technologies. Not only that, but they identified AI risks as the most likely to occur in the next few years, specifically between 2025 and 2031. That's now. So we've got this technology that experts around the world are saying that we're not really that prepared for, that's most likely to cause problems in the immediate future, yet we're racing to deploy it everywhere as fast as possible. This disconnect tells you something, doesn't it? So a consideration. What if an AI winter isn't something to fear, unless you're a collection of very wealthy AI-focused billionaires, but something that could help humans build a healthier, more sustainable relationship with these powerful tools? Consider the actual place in the classroom, in the learning journey, in our lives, and more. So what happens if an AI improvement stopped? Right now, a cognitive crash. Mm. Well, I asked for AI models to play this scenario out, and I'll be honest, I'm kind of hoping for a drop in the temperature based on what might be happening. So AI hits the wall, there's no GPT-42, there's no miraculous breakthroughs, no more good data for them to kind of train on and learn from. The smartest AI system in the world right now is capable, it's flawed, And it's stuck. So what happens next? Initially, there's going to be a bit of shock. The markets will freak out. There's been trillion dollar valuations for data centers and those those build outs of those AI labs. They're all of a sudden gone, almost overnight. Investors realize they're betting on infinite upgrades and overnight the hype balloon deflates. But the panic doesn't last because when they're speeding train stalls, something very interesting happens here. People finally start to learn to drive the cars they already have. So talk of brolygarchies and the tech billionaires ceases a little bit as these tech gods who have integrated the AI into various systems are now forced into being maintenance men to keep what little control they have alive. And then there's the adaptation kind of phase. Industries stop waiting for the next miracle release. Instead of asking, well, what will GP212 do? Companies ring every ounce of value of what's already there. Just like if you knew that your phone was the last one that you'd ever own. 
You'd master every shortcut, every hidden setting. Businesses and schools would start to master today's AI instead of waiting for tomorrow's brand new invention because it's not coming. In the classroom, there's a big education rethink that probably happens here, and I think it's where the plateau really matters. Schools stop saying, hey, we'll redesign assessment when the next model drops, because who knows what that's going to do. But universities stop chasing the hype of AI-enhanced everything, and they settle into a new rhythm. They teach critical thinking, creativity, and resilience alongside AI literacy, and things like task stewardship. Students learn to be collaborators, not passengers. Coding boot camps don't promise to ride the next exponential wave or fancy tool that's come through. They teach how to maintain and creatively bend the tools that we already have. Humanities rebound, because if the machines aren't racing ahead, human perspective suddenly matters more, not less. Not to get too nerdy on this, he says. Uh... If there's a space to do it, Nick, it's here. Come on. <laughs> Perfect. From interstellar space travel, there's a, there's a concept where it says, is it better to get a slower ship moving at a fraction of the speed of the light, leave now to, to get to wherever, you know, Mars or, or, or the next galaxy, blah, blah, blah. or do you wait until you develop a faster craft, maybe one that goes at the speed of light? It's called the wait-go problem or, or the optimal departure time paradox, right? Do you, or maybe in a more personal sort of a human way, like, I mean, wait for the, the drop of the perfect runners, right? Waiting for those to come out next season or just lace up what you got and get out on the road and, and get, it, get your miles in. You know, we're, there's no perfect time. The best time is now. I'll link it to uh, to Douglas Adams from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, there we go. 42 for anyone, anyone who's in the know. But it's waiting for fast and light travel is like waiting forever. So there's no point waiting for something that might never arrive in terms of that infinite expectation that you might have. So what happens in the job market? So the workforce reality here when AI stops is that the jobs that AI already took, so things like data entry, junior coding, those content farms, they're probably still gone. They're not coming back. The mass unemployment apocalypse that we see in the news and the media probably doesn't arrive. Instead, we get things like hybrid jobs, AI wranglers, prompt artisans, data curators or, or smugglers for people who need the kind of black market data. Lawyers still argue cases, but with AI as their paralegal. Teachers still teach, but with AI as their assistant. Anxiety about being replaced slowly gives way to relief. AI is a ceiling. AI has a ceiling, not a storm cloud. And in the human term, there's a real cultural twist. Once the fear of runaway superintelligence kind of fades, we kind of rediscover humanism. Artists matter again. Philosophers get booked out again. Even carpenters feel newly relevant because the plateau proves a simple truth. Some things just don't automate and perhaps shouldn't have been automated. Now let's be clear. The plateau probably isn't real. Progress will grind forward even if slower. But living as if the plateau were real is the discipline that perhaps humans need right now. Because right now, too many schools, too many businesses and governments are kind of paralyzed by the speeding bullet. Why bother? GP242 will do better. The mindset is useless. Waiting for the miracle model guarantees you build nothing today because, well, GPT is going to do it soon. So here's a cheat code. Act like the plateau is already here. Build your systems, your teaching, your careers around today's AI. Limited, flawed, and powerful. If the next leak comes, great. If it doesn't, you've still built something resilient. That's the only way education and, honestly, society here stays human, intentional, and ahead of the curve. Yeah, absolutely. And the the thing is that this might not be theoretical anymore. So in June, uh, Apple, to, to great fanfare, released a study showing that our most advanced models at the time, to be fair, so 03, uh, Summit 3.7, they suffered, so this may have changed, but they, they at that time suffered from, quote, complete accuracy collapse on complex problems. So to be fair, Apple had and still are lagging in the AI race. You, you're right, the foundational models are there, but not in the LLM space. But when they published research saying, uh, quote, again, bigger isn't better, it's, it's kind of convenient timing, uh, great exercise in reframing, if nothing else. But then I think Ethan Mollick is, um, is really backing you entirely uh, on, on this whole piece when, when he notes the real issue, right? So people are looking for a reason to not have to deal with what AI can do today. I mean, I, I would just, my own two cents, just echoing both of you, if there are no further developments, we still have years of work to properly reconfigure and to realign with what we already have in this space. We already have major AI scientists, including Ilya Soskova, say the biggest AI models are scraping the bottom of the public internet. 
adding more publicly available data no longer brings significant improvements. And the incremental update in functionality we saw with GPT-5 and even Google's releases are showing this kind of plateau effect. That being said, a recent report suggests that we have leaped ahead of where we're expected to be in 2022. This report gave AI the chance of getting gold at the Math Olympiad about 10%, which it famously actually did achieve a few months back. But perhaps this giant leap means we have a period of pause, the opportunity for us to kind of catch our breath and understand this new, weird digital creature and how we should live with it, how we should learn with it, just in time for it to do whatever next amazing thing that it might be doing. Well, listeners, thank you for listening. If you have not already, please leave us a review, share around within your network, and most of all, hit subscribe on whatever platform you are at. For those watching on YouTube, we are on all your favorite podcast platforms. Those who love to see our faces, you can find us on YouTube too. We'd love to tell you what's on next week's episode, but it's a world that moves way too fast. So you'll just have to tune in. Until then, stay curious, stay intelligent, stay the human in the loop. 